Okay, so our next speaker is Abigail Dial, who's from Princeton University. So uh, Abigail got a, a bachelor's and PhD at uh, Harvard University with uh, Eric Jacobson, and then began at, as an assistant professor at Princeton in 2008, but quickly made an incredibly big impact in the field because by 2017, she was the Barton Hepburn Professor of Chemistry, the chaired professorship in a very short period of time. In her early work, she made some really important developments in nickel catalyzed chemistry and then uh, combined it with uh, photo redox chemistry that opened up a lot of really interesting uh, opportunities in synthesis in general, carrying out fast reactions and also extending it towards uh, CH functionalization applications. And she uh, has been recognized for her work uh, earlier in her career in 2013. She got a Cope Scholar Award from the ACS. And uh, in 2019, uh, she got the 15th Hirata Award, a very prestigious award um, uh, for her work as well. So uh, Abigail, it's great to have you here. And we're very much looking forward to your talk. Uh, the title of your talk is uh, Photocatalysis Photo with Nickel. Very Thank you. Uh, can story everyone story. hear me? Yes, we can hear you really okay. well. All right, and slides are up. Okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I think you know, more, now more than ever, I'm grateful for the opportunity, right, to connect with our community in this manner and to share chemistry. I'm sure many people feel similarly. Uh, so thank you to the CCHF for hosting these virtual symposia. About Five years ago now, my group became interested in combining visible light photoredox catalysis with nickel catalysis to enable cross-coupling reactions that weren't otherwise possible with nickel, and for that matter, palladium catalysis alone. And through the contributions of many other research groups, this is an area that has developed uh, and I think has become particularly enabling for coupling uh, abundant and um, uh, stable uh, molecules such as carboxylic acids, amine derivatives, ether derivatives, as surrogates for organometallic reagents and cross-coupling. The role of the photoredox catalyst in most of these cases is to undergo photo-induced electron transfer with a substrate to generate a substrate radical, or to undergo photo-induced electron transfer with a nickel catalyst to modulate its oxidation state. And given the impact that this single sort of elementary step has had on nickel catalyzed cross coupling, um, my group became interested in uh, learning about other mechanisms that uh, where in transition metals harness visible light energy to, uh, and whether any of these alternative mechanisms could be deployed in nickel catalyzed cross coupling to design sort of new reactions. And the specific elementary step that uh, caught our attention was photo induced ligand dissociation. Uh, this is an elementary step that actually has a important uh, history uh, in sort of early examples of CH activation. Uh, but uh, the specific example that we were interested in is from a, a study that uh, the Nocera Laboratory published in 2015, uh, where they showed that these nickel-3 trichloride complexes can absorb visible light and in doing so uh, undergo a photo elimination of chlorine radical. Uh, so this caught our attention because chlorine radical uh, is a potent hydrogen abstractor and in fact can abstract right, some of the strongest sp3 ch bonds in free radical chlorinations. However, chlorine radical is typically generated uh, from highly oxidizing chlorine sources uh, like chlorine gas, uh, usually in high concentrations um, and using UV light. And so we envisioned that this photo elimination approach could uh, address each of these limitations and in combination with nickel cross coupling enable uh, CH, uh, sp3 CH cross coupling of stable um, or sort of abundant alkenes. In particular, the way that we thought that this might uh, be affected is that we could use an organic chloride like an aryl chloride as both a cross coupling port partner and a source of chlorine radical. Uh, that it would undergo oxidative addition to nickel zero to generate a nickel two complex. We envisioned using a photoredox catalyst to oxidize uh, nickel two to nickel three through photo-induced electron transfer. 
And then based off of the precedent from the Nocera lab, uh, we proposed that this nickel-3 complex could undergo photoelimination to generate chlorine radical. Hydrogen abstraction with a substrate bond would generate an uh, organic radical that could recombine with nickel. Uh, and then reductive elimination would generate our CH cross-coupled product. And finally, uh, single electron transfer would turn over both the nickel and the iridium uh, catalyst. So to test this proposal, uh, ben Shields, who is a graduate student uh, in my lab, uh, decided to explore application of this strategy to the alpha aerylation of THF. Uh, and what he found through experimentation is that this fluorinated iridium photocatalyst in combination with a nickel catalyst and dibutyl bipyridine as ligand could in fact enable the alpha aerylation of THF as well as other ethers. And so this is uh, a select scope of this reaction, but I'm not going to go into it in any detail uh, here. What I will point out is that at the same time that we sort of published this work, uh, there were two other methods that were published uh, that are nickel photoredox methods to accomplish similar, albeit mechanistically distinct, uh, transformations from the Molander lab and the McMillan lab. One interesting difference between our work and theirs is our use of aryl chlorides, and in fact, our reliance on aryl chlorides since it's supplying the chlorine radical for hydrogen and abstraction. Um, and interestingly, um, in, in their work, so they use aryl bromides and iodides, and interestingly, in the vast majority of nickel photoredox coupling methods uh, do use aryl bromides and iodides as coupling uh, reactions. Um, a student of mine just recently did uh, uh, sort of a quick uh, survey of this and found of the 450 uh, papers or so that have been published on nickel photoredox catalysis, uh, only 10 of them about uh, use aryl chlorides as coupling partners compared with the bromides and iodides. And most of those come, in fact, from this photo elimination strategy that I'm going to tell you about today. And so in thinking about applications of uh, this approach in synthesis, uh, we became uh, sort of focused on um, uh, sort of considering applications that would uh, sort of take advantage of the use of aryl chlorides, in particular their abundance uh, and low cost as compared to aryl bromides and iodides. And so the ap first application that uh, came to mind, and this is work from uh, Matt Nielsen, Ben, uh, and Jin Yi, was to consider preparing benzaldehydes from aryl chlorides uh, through selective CH functionalization of dioxalane. And this was uh, appealing to us because benzaldehydes are, of course, uh, very versatile intermediates in synthesis, uh, yet are still used primarily at early stages in synthesis due to some of uh, the limitations associated with their preparation, in particular things like wilsmeyer hack chemistry or aryl anion chemistry, uh, limit functional group tolerance. Uh, we also noticed that um, there are orders of magnitude fewer commercially available benzaldehydes compared with aryl chlorides. Um, and so uh, a goal was to demonstrate that the CH functionalization uh, sort of our nickel photoredox strategy could enable access to both early stage and late stage aldehydes that wouldn't otherwise be sort of accessible. And so through some uh, optimization, uh, Matt, Ben, and Jenny were able to sort of uh, identify conditions that would generate um, a host of different aldehydes from aryl chlorides. Um, you can see both electron deficient and electron rich. Uh, aryl uh, uh, benzaldehydes are sort of available from this uh, methodology as well as heteroaryl um, uh, substrates as well. Uh, a number, uh, you can generate benzaldehydes with a number of other functional groups present, so primary alcohols that are unprotected, uh, amides, for example, um, and you can see some other examples of more late stage uh, 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 products uh, on this slide. I'll point out that our collaborator, Mike Sakuda, who's from Celgene, is also able to demonstrate uh, sort of gram scale formulations of a number of these uh, substrates uh, also set up on the bench top. Um, and in many cases, he was able to isolate the, the aldehydes without chromatography. So one of the reasons that aldehydes are so useful is, of course, that you can uh, do oxidation or reduction chemistry to access you know, esters, alcohols, um, or toluenes directly from them. Uh, however, 
you know, this is sort of introduces some redox inefficiencies as well as sort of potential sort of functional group tolerance uh, questions. And so moving forward, um, Stavros, Ben, and Makeda uh, questioned whether the nickel photoredox strategy could uh, enable introduction of C1 uh, groups at every oxidation state uh, sort of shown here directly. And to initially test this, what they envisioned is they could use trimethyl orthoformate, uh, sort of an abundant solvent, as a C1 source for a sterification of aryl chlorides. And under sort of our previously identified conditions, this in fact worked nice. Well, we, we saw product, I shouldn't say it worked nicely, um, but we saw about 8% yield of the, the ester, the methyl ester product, which was uh, exciting and sort of a, a promising result. But um, we also saw formation of this benzylic ether product. Um, and this was actually not too surprising um, in that uh, this is likely arising from functionalization of the methyl groups of trimethyl orthoformate. Uh, these are, uh, while our stronger CH bonds by about a kcal per mole, there are also nine of them relative to the one methine CH bond. Um, and so we, to some extent, expected this as a byproduct. But we also saw, in fact, the major product was something that we hadn't expected, uh, which was the methylation uh, of the serol chloride. Um, and I'll say this was uh, not an unpleasant surprise uh, in that of the products that are shown here, uh, the methylation product of the aryl chloride was probably the one that we were most interested in accessing, but had the least idea how to accomplish since our preliminary sort of efforts to use methane as a CH uh, source uh, were sort of not successful. The reason why this was attractive to us is that methylation of aryl and heteroarenes uh, is a well as, you know, known strategy for improving the biological activity uh, of small molecules. Uh, nevertheless, there's various limitations associated with uh, cross-coupling approaches to methylation, um, most notably that it often requires the use of organometallic reagents or sort of uh, highly reactive electrophilic alkylating agents like methyl iodide or methyl tosylate. And here we had sort of inadvertently come upon uh, a methylating agent, trimethylethroformate, which is relatively uh, stable um, and uh, functional group tolerant, since it's, of course, a solvent, uh, typically. So the way that we think it serves as a methylating agent is uh, uh, shown here, and this is certainly inspired uh, sort of by precedent using xanthate esters and oxygen-centered radicals. What we propose is that upon hydrogen abstraction to generate this tertiary radical, um, if this is slow to undergo reductive elimination with nickel to generate the ester, it instead does beta scission, um, which you can see is certainly kinetically feasible, uh, to liberate a methyl radical and uh, uh, dimethyl carbonate. Um, and what we see sort of through sort of um, uh, various uh, mechanistic experiments is indeed the formation of dimethyl carbonate in a one-to-one -one ratio as uh, methylation uh, under these reaction conditions. So Stavros and Makeda sort of uh, set out to try and optimize this for methylation um, and ultimately were able to identify conditions uh, that um, eliminated entirely the, the ester uh, product um, and reduced the benzylic ether product to about sort of 10% yield. So we still unfortunately see a little bit uh, of that product, uh, byproduct. Uh, nevertheless, um, sort of under these conditions, we can sort of access um, quite good yields of methylation uh, for a range of different aryl and heteroaryl chlorides. Uh, I'll just point out sort of my favorite example here, which is uh, perfenazine as a substrate, uh, where we're able to methylate the aryl chloride in the presence of a primary alcohol and tertiary amine that would typically get alkylated if you were using uh, an electrophilic methyl source. And here are a few examples of heteroaryl chlorides. Uh, these are all sort of selected because the, the methylated products aren't accessible via meniski type uh, chemistry. And you can see the cross coupling reaction has broad tolerance for a, a range of hetero uh, aromatic uh, systems. One of the limitations of this uh, chemistry uh, that we hadn't seen for the formulation uh, or uh, THF aerylation chemistry uh, is its sensitivity to the electronics of the aryl chloride coupling partner. 
And in particular, what we find is both electron neutral and electron rich aryl chlorides uh, are unreactive under these conditions, likely because they are slow to undergo oxidative addition to nickel. This led Stavros and Makeda to try aryl bromide since these tend to undergo oxidative addition faster than aryl chlorides. Uh, but these also uh, are unreactive under the, the coupling conditions for likely a different reason, which is that hydrogen atom abstraction by bromine radical is unfavorable. So to overcome this challenge, Stavros and Makeda sort of came up with the idea of separating the two roles of the aryl halide as a coupling partner in halogen radical source. And in particular, to use aryl bromides as coupling partners, but then to add uh, a five equivalents in this case of tetrabutyl ammonium chloride uh, in order to do halide exchange at nickel and then uh, generate chlorine radical. And this works quite nicely. So now we have access to sort of the full range of electron sort of deficient, electron neutral, and electron rich aryl chlorides as coupling partners. And I'll sort of mention, I think more generally, I think this is an exciting result because it demonstrates our ability to generate a high energy radical, chlorine radical, from a chloride source um, without using um, right, a strong oxidant. Uh, so in, in this system, the iridium photocatalyst is not sufficiently oxidizing uh, to oxidize chloride to chlorine radical. Uh, so the examples I've shown you thus far um, all involve cross-coupling of fairly activated CH bonds. Uh, so from THF to trimethyl formate and 1,3-dioxalane. Uh, and as you've probably seen, we also use them in solvent quantities, which of course is fine if you're using solvent type uh, substrates. Uh, but going forward, uh, Laura and uh, Jesus were interested in whether we could apply this strategy to uh, less activated systems, um, uh, like unactivated alkanes and if we could identify conditions that would allow us to lower the loading of the CH partner, such that this could be applicable for late stage uh, uh, functionalization of uh, natural products through CH cross-coupling. And so in our first uh, examination of this, what uh, Lauren Jesus found is that cyclohexane indeed does undergo aerylation under these uh, conditions, which was quite exciting for us. However, as you can see sort of here, um, we see moderate yield even with 10 equivalents of uh, cyclohexane, and then that uh, reactivity drops off quite significantly as you go down to one equivalent. Uh, their hypothesis as to why this was uh, sort of a, a problem is shown here, and that is that the product of the aerylation reaction features right, a significantly weaker CH bond as compared with the starting material. And, Likely, as you drop the concentration of cyclohexane and the concentration of the product becomes competitive, you're unproductively consuming your chlorine radical under these conditions. So to overcome this, uh, they considered introducing um, a functional group that was electron withdrawing as a coupling partner, um, such that it would disfavor hydrogen abstraction from the product on the basis of pol uh, polar effects. Um, and so they chose um, acyl chlorides, or in this case, chloroformate as a coupling partner, both in order to overcome this strategy or this problem, but also because we envisioned that this would be a very uh, nice synthetic uh, uh, reaction where you'd be able to take right, a, a inert alkane and generate a carbon-carbon bond with a functional group like an ester that, of course, is synthetic chemists we know how to do all sorts of uh, chemistry with. Uh, and we we're really pleased to find that um, under, well, after quite a bit of optimization, um, uh, Lauren Hayes were able to find conditions that delivered uh, the ester product in uh, nearly 70% yield using three equivalents of uh, cyclohexane. You can see, unfortunately, the reactivity does drop off a little bit as we reduce the equivalents down to one, but still we were very pleased uh, to sort of see this level of reactivity. Um, so, and so, um, going forward, they wanted to evaluate whether their proposal in terms of the impact of polar effects on this reaction was in fact uh, a reasonable one. So to do so, they conducted a Hammett study where they used as substrates ethyl benzenes um, and to explore the impact of the substituent on the rate of the CH uh, uh, cross-coupling reaction. And so what you, they found is shown here 
is that as you increase the electron donating group uh, uh, of, you introduce an electron donating group into Bethel benzene, you see faster cross-coupling um, compared with electron withdrawing substituents. And in fact, you see a nice linear correlation uh, between the sigma plus value of that X substituent and the relative rate uh, for the CH cross-coupling. By contrast, if you were to plot that uh, relative rate compared with the bond dissociation free energy uh, of the substrates, you see no correlation. Um, and this tells us, and sort of is consistent at least with polar effects uh, governing sort of uh, reactivity uh, in the system and consistent with our original hypothesis that led to uh, this type of cross-coupling uh, reaction with the chloroformates. If we look at substrates uh, like an unactivated alkane, uh, isopentane, that do doesn't have uh, functional, uh, uh, functionality in it. In this case, we see selectivity for CH uh, functionalization that's consistent with um, or sort of correlated with the bond association free energy uh, of the CH bonds. Uh, you can see sort of here uh, in uh, this evans polani plot. So these two effects, the polar effects, as well as the effect uh, of the CH bond strength um, can be used to either predict or at least rationalize the selectivity that we see in these cross-coupling reactions with a broad range of substrates. Um, and you'll see here sort of examples, select examples that uh, include unactivated sort of acyclic alkanes, uh, toluene as a substrate, as well as more functionalized substrates. And I'll just point out a few uh, sort of highlights, something like cyclopentanone or the cyclopentyl nitrile undergo CH cross-coupling sort of to give exclusive regioisomer uh, and sort of quite nice yields uh, using three equivalents of the substrate. Um, in the case of an acyclic ketone, you can get reasonably high selectivity for uh, esterification uh, at this methylene position, which I think nicely complements some of the more sort of recent strategies using palladium catalysis and directing groups uh, to do sort of similar types of uh, cross-coupling reactions, for example, with their alkylides. Okay, so in the last just two minutes, I want to uh, briefly return to mechanism and the proposed mechanism for these reactions. As I mentioned, we were inspired by the Nocera work to propose that uh, these uh, reactions are proceeding via photoelimination from a nickel-3 chloride complex. Uh, to generate chlorine radical. However, an alternative proposal uh, was put forth um, by a few different research groups uh, that uh, in sort of related reactions that these may be proceeding via nickel-2 elimination um, of uh, or photo elimination of a halogen radical um, instead. And so we wanted to evaluate whether this was possible um, um, operative in our system. And so uh, to do this, um, we started to look at the photophysics and the photochemistry of nickel-2 complexes. Uh, and I'm going to summarize sort of this very briefly here, but a student at my lab, Stephen Ting, uh, who was working in collaboration with the Scholes lab and the Castellano lab, uh, prepared a series of nickel-2 aryl chloride complexes. Um, what he found is when you excite these complexes, they relax to a uh, triplet DD excited state um, that does feature um, bond weakening of the nickel ligand bonds. However, this excited state is too low in energy uh, to enable elimination of a chlorine or a bromine radical. You can see here the nickel two chlorine bond is computed to be about 77 kcals per mole. Indeed, in sort of experimental work where we've irradiated nickel two complexes in the presence of uh, a radical trap, we see no evidence for uh, chlorine radical generation. Sort of suggesting that uh, nickel-2 photoelimination, at least under our conditions and in this sort of, uh, these systems is not sort of operating. Instead, if we compute the, uh, the bond association energy of the nickel-3 chlorine bond, you see significant bond weakening relative to the nickel-2 oxidation state. Um, and we have good evidence that um, the nickel-2 complex, uh, these nickel-2 aryl chlorides, uh, do undergo single electron transfer with the excited state of the photocatalyst uh, through stern volmer quenching studies. So finally, I'll just show you some stoichiometric studies that we've done on the THF aerylation that support that from nickel-2, you need both an oxidant and light to liberate chlorine radical and to do CH aerylation. 
So in particular, Ben prepared uh, these nickel two aryl chloride complexes. Um, and when you subject them to light, uh, but no oxidant, uh, you see no uh, alpha aerylation of, the, of THF. When you add oxidant, but in the dark, um, you also see no CH aerylation product. Uh, instead, what you see is primarily aryl chloride formation, which is consistent with an oxidatively induced reductive elimination of the aryl chloride. So it provides evidence that oxidation is taking place. Uh, but finally, if you include both light and oxidant, you see CH aerylation take place, um, uh, which supports this idea that photoelimination is taking place from nickel three. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, conclude there. Um, uh, hopefully this has given you a taste of the possibilities for affecting sp 3 ch cross-coupling using nickel and photoredox catalysis. And I think an important takeaway here is that the interaction of visible light with nickel is important to think about, and in fact can also serve as a platform for designing new uh, reactions. Uh, and so finally, I've mentioned all the students um, as I went through, but I'll just thank my group in its entirety. Um, I work with a fantastic group of scientists and people. Um, I dearly miss interacting with them in person, um, but hopefully that will sort of happen again soon. Uh, and I'll thank the NIH um, and the Department of Energy through our BioLEC uh, Center uh, for support uh, for um, this work. And I will be happy to take any questions. Very good, lovely. Well, I should never have asked, um, are there any questions? Because there's, there's, there's about 40 of them. Um, so so I, I'm sort of overwhelmed at the moment, but I, I'll ask a couple. Okay. Uh, a lovely talk uh, from mm -hmm. Meredith Allen. Uh, when increasing the stability of the carbon radical formed in the methylation reaction, I using an ethyl formate as the radical source, does this reaction work any better? It's a great question. Um, so we can do ethylation um, and isopropylation using other orthoformates. Um, the reaction does not work better, um, but uh, the reasons why are uh, complex. So one of them is that uh, we are using solvent quantities of these orthoformates, and it turns out that the nickel complex becomes relatively insoluble once you turn to greasier orthoformates. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons why. Uh, we had high hopes uh, for using uh, sort of some of these other orthoformates since um, the competitive abstraction um, uh, and sort of cross-coupling may not be as big of an issue with some of those due to steric effects. But, um, but unfortunately, yeah, they do work, but they don't work better. Okay, great. And then a lot of people are asking uh, different types of questions related to the, the, the sodium tungstate. Um, yeah. but, but there's one that I, I really like, it's been asked. So, so uh, this comes from a group in China and they said, where did the choice of sodium tungstate come from? Did That's you just question. screen every additive available? So um, Laura and Jesus are incredible uh, scientists and certainly went well beyond what um, I would have ever have looked at um, in optimizing that reaction. And it really was an ordeal to optimize it. Um, so, you know, it turns out, and I think uh, Laura sort of found this in the literature, that sodium tungstate is known to be a very good kinetic uh, sink for HCl. And we generate an equivalent of HCl, right, in this reaction. And we had done control studies to know that that was a problem. Um, that it led to diminished reactivity if you have um, HCl around. Um, and I think through sort of scouring the literature and a little bit of just throwing the kitchen sink at it, um, uh, that's what we settled upon. And we'd seen, um, I think a silicate base also works reasonably well. Um, so it was, yeah, it was a combination of really good literature searching um, and, you know, uh, working really hard to try and get this thing optimized. Okay, great. And then one, one final question. Where did it go? This is from uh, uh, Dr. Bharat Kumar. In your photo redox methylation reactions, the reaction time periods are pretty long. Uh, what's, the rea what's the reason behind that? W which step of the reaction mechanism is slow? Have you observed dimerization of your methyl radicals 
under these conditions and the uh, formation of ethane? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so we have not done sort of an extensive uh, study of the kinetics of this system. Um, what my sort of guess is, which is, was alluded to a little bit at the last slide on the stoichiometric studies, is that um, often what's happening in the system is you do oxidative addition, uh, single electron oxidation to nickel three, and then it reductively eliminates the aryl chloride and it just turns back over and over and over. Um, and it's relatively inefficient, right, to get, at, once you have a very low concentration of nickel three that has a short lifetime to do that photo elimination. Um, and so my sense is that that's the limiting step. And the reason why these things are slow is it's sort of chugging back and forth, um, oxidizing or undergoing oxidative addition, and then an oxidatively induced reductive elimination of the aryl chloride, and only occasionally getting um, chlorine radical um, and uh, proceeding to the functionalization step. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Now, one of the hard things when with a virtual talk is you, you don't usually get the sort of natural affirmation you have when you when you finish a, a live talk. So hopefully, when you're going through answering the 39 questions, you'll take that as the affirmation uh, going forward. That. And actually, Rio has got some instructions on how to answer the questions too. So please take a look at that. That's in chat. Will do. Okay. Thank you. So great talk. Thanks very much.